valuation for a portfolio when it would impact risk or return. And you know, the research that we've done to date at Bridgeway has mostly found that we were able to find some systematic ways to integrate that thinking to address some risks in the portfolio that, that were not already addressed by the financial statement analysis that we were doing. So thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. I'm your host, Christian D. Evans. And guys, we have a very special guest on today. She's a previous CEO, chief executive officer, and president at Bridgeway Capital Management, which manage billions upon billions of dollars, have incredible, a lot of different investment thesis. She's also a member of the firm's board of directors. She's president of Bridgeway Funds and serves as a committee including portfolio innovation, risk responsible investing, enterprise risk, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're going to be talking about a lot of their strategy and the way she thinks about the markets at a macro and a micro level. And now she's also a consistent consultant for a lot of large, very well-known companies. I'm very excited about having it all. Please welcome my next guest, the one and only Tamara Philippe. How are you doing today, Tamara? I'm doing great, Christian. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm so excited about diving into this because one of the things you have been in the uh, working with Bridgeway for almost coming on to 16 years, recently stepped down, now going to consulting, working with a lot of consult, uh, a lot of large companies and so forth. But I'm curious, what? Let's let's talk a little bit about your journey. What got you into the financial world, and what what got you excited about that industry? Wow, well, I guess let's start with, that was kind of an accident. Um, I think I had every plan not to be in the financial world, uh, but what got me in, and, and it was, Christian, almost 18 years that I spent working at Bridgeway, and it's been about a month that I since I stepped down, so I'm in the middle of transition. But, you know, I came into finance and Bridgeway really just because of the unique pro proposition that Bridgeway had to be at the intersection of a for-profit company and a, and a purpose-driven company. And I was really drawn to that. Uh, before I heard about Bridgeway, I was kind of uh, maybe allergic to the world of finance. Um, and this shows up in, I don't know if you're aware of like the Edelman Global Trust Survey, but you know, the world of finance has kind of a bad rap. Um, especially among people like me who grew up, I'm a first generation college student. Um, I really thought the world of finance was just all about um, rich people getting richer. And I really didn't want to be a part of that. Um, I really wanted to make a bigger difference in the world. Um, and but I was wrong, um, as I have been at times in my career. And once I learned about Bridgeway and learned more about the world of finance, I realized that, you know, this is a very purpose driven field. Um, and even, you know, the, the idea that I mentioned of it's when you rank all the industries in the world on this global trust survey that Edelman does, you know, finance has been dead last for like a decade, which is just very disturbing because, you know, what do you need most for like the people that you're going to trust with your money? You need trust. Um, and so I thought, oh, wow, I, I could be a part of making a difference in that and making the you know, world of finance and investing better. And I felt like Bridgeway was the type of organization that would do it. And so that's how I got into it after pretty much trying really hard not to do it. <laughs> Well, you, I know you actually uh, also had a, a degree in computer science. And what I find interesting about computer science, you guys talk about this on, on your uh, Bridgeway's you know, investment thesis a little bit. You guys are very data focused and really try to get the emotion bias or our own biases out of the way, which I found very interesting. And so I'm curious, you know, coming from your journey, your story, it was an accident getting, getting into Bridgeway, Bridgeway. But with computer science and having that data analytical kind of base, how has that helped you in regards to being the CEO and you know working very closely with Bridgeway and evolving with Bridgeway? Well, uh, you know, absolutely. That was one of the things that also very much attracted me and got me to get over some of my, you know, places I was wrong and the biases I had against finances. That Bridgeway is an a quantitative investing firm, so everything is driven by data and science and analytics, which I was very attracted to. Many of the people on the investment team also have undergraduate or graduate degrees in computer science and, and program for a living. Of course, I, I didn't do that, but I studied that. Um, and, and I've just always been attracted by the power of 
competing to really make, uh, uh, allow us to get more accomplished. Uh, and so I was able to combine those passions in, in, the, in the role at Bridgeway and be that bridge mostly between the people that had that technical knowledge and that investment knowledge uh, and be able to translate that over to clients and investors to truly help them understand what we did, how we did it, and why you know they should place their confidence and trust in us to manage their money to the best of our ability. So uh, you know, I just I loved being able to combine those two things. Well, that's what I find so interesting. I would imagine that's an art and a skill to some extent because some of your clients, right, like just average of of Americans or or just uh, overall not always financial literate, right? In regards to all the fancy little instruments, all the fa fancy investment thesis and strategies. So even though you guys are very data and quantitative you know, heavy, how are you guys able to bridge the gap to you know, simplify some of you guys' thesis or some of your vehicles that you guys do leverage to your clients and educate them in the proper manner? What, what, what did that process look like? Uh, well, that, you know, that sounds, that's really a simple question, Christian, and I, that it's really hard to answer. <laughs> so a lot of hard work is the, is, is the quick answer that, that is coming to. And something that I would say, you know, the team that, you know, is still there that I helped build is gonna continue to work on. I mean, we, it was a constant um, effort to try to simplify down what we did in a way that regular people could understand and build confidence in because nobody wants to invest in something that they don't understand how it works. Um, and so again, the people like me, I would say innate to me, one of the reasons why I studied computer science and one of the things that I use from it that I've continued, you know, even though I'm not doing the technical job of programming is just that ability to problem solve and to take uh, problems, break them down and come through with a step, to, step by step co conclusion it, that's what you do in programming in my mind and and you know at, you have to be able to kind of take that up to the highest level to block that out and that's in a way what we do with our communication at Bridgeway and I mean honestly any of the businesses that I've consulted for over the course of my career in, especially in the early days is that you, we have to be able to break down problems break down answers even and say look these are the key elements and then, you know, if you want more of the details, of course I have them, but if you don't need them, you know, these are the key things that you need to have confidence in. And, you know, to come back to your question, at Bridgeway, it's like, look, we look at decades of data. We find what we believe to be the drivers of expected returns. And then we use our quantitative skills to make sure that you get exposure to those. Gotcha. I like how you, you laid that out for us to understand this. And I was curious as you were talking a little bit in regards to you, you guys mentioned very focused on quantitative, but as you've invested in different investment theses, you guys have different strategies and, and different things, you know, U.S. equities, international equities, alternatives, right? Different kind of vehicles you guys focus on. And e even with those, you like focus on large cap growth, large cap value, small cap value. My point is, is I love to dive in, not to one of those vehicles themselves, but really about when you get the, the feedback loop of as data is, is coming in and you have to kind of maybe adjust or pivot according to whatever that, that micro data is, is telling you. But also there are certain, certain things like obviously COVID that affected that, but that's a macro thing that you couldn't you know, um, adjust. And so sometimes it's best not to pivot because it's saying, well, if we plan this over, over long term, 5, 10, 15 years, the path is going to be consistent versus, you know, obviously focusing on short term and pivoting when really you shouldn't pivot at all, right? So it's really knowing when to pivot, what to pivot, when you're getting that data and looking at all that data and how do you guys analyze it. So I guess that's my really yeah. my question because I know you focus on big strategy and yeah. obviously saying, hey, what's that clear vision? What do we, you know, what, what, what do we want to accomplish? Reverse engineering and, and laying out the steps. So I'd love mm -hmm. to unpack that, how you process that and how do you associate it, when to pivot, when not to pivot with the right data, Tamara. Yes, oh gosh. Um, so as, as you get to know me and all the people who know me well will know, like I have about a million thoughts colliding in my head right now to, to answer your question. But I guess I'll, I'll start with three. Um, one is uh, one of the most important things in business 
and in life is to know what you're good at and, and to focus on that and not try to do something that you're not good at. Uh, so as we're talking about, you know, you're talking about, okay, like, let's look at the long-term data, but how do we know when to stick to that and when to pivot? Well, what, in what, how we invested at Bridgeway when I was there, um, it was, hey, we're good at the long term. We're good at looking at the decades of data and everything that we've learned and seen is that we haven't been able to develop a model or a way to pivot on short term information that works consistently enough. So we don't do that. Um, that's that's how, and, and again, that was data driven at Bridgeway. So we knew what we were good at and we stuck to it. And the key was to find investors that understood that that's what we were going to do. And if they wanted something else, they really should should find that from someone else who, you know, purported to be good at that. Another thing that one of my former colleagues says, and I like to quote him, he quotes, I think Mark Twain, but there's dispute about who really said this, but it's the idea that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So while the world had never experienced a global pandemic quite like COVID-19, the world had experienced pandemics before. And, you know, the markets had experienced crises before. So what we have found over, you know, Bridgeway's history started in 1993, but we've we studied decades of market data that's around, you know, way farther than that is that you know history doesn't repeat exactly but it rhymes and so there is actually data in the data um, in the data sets that we use that gives markers and in fact statistically significant indicators of how stocks and in, in Bridgeway's case it's mostly equity mostly the stock market that we're investing in globally um, how they're going to react to different things and we find that to be a more reliable way to invest and I still do personally, even though I don't work there anymore, than just how Joe might feel today when he wakes up. So that, that's how we felt at Bridgeway. Um, and yeah. and I, I forgot the third thing by now because... <laughs> <laughs> No, I love your energy as well. I, I love that you get excited about this, and, and, and yeah. obviously I, I can tell from that. And you, you mentioned some really cool things in, in regards to how you guys approach it. So you guys focus on, well, you guys are long-term thinkers, period. And so whatever strategy you guys deploy will fit that alignment or that foundation that you guys are, is your core value. And, if, and you also attract investors that also think the same way. So you guys yeah. don't think and, and deploy capital into small you know things that aren't your your north star or what your what your experts at which which really okay. helps me understand like what what bridgeway stands for um now when you're diving into i always find data so interesting because it's like telling me a story right and as the individual I, or even coming from marketing data when i'm learning and understanding it's telling me a certain story and i have to optimize according to whatever that data is telling me but also what's the story telling me in regards to what that is uh what i'm noticing and so how do you guys, do you guys have, um, you know, a process or a methodology on interpreting the data? So it, of course, is, is aligned. I know it, it may be like re, reiterating almost that we were asking the same question, but I just want to make sure I'm, I'm asking a different thing because it's, it's, I, I'm always intrigued by how you guys interpret the data because someone could have the same data but interpret it drastically different, maybe even internally, right, in your team. But then how do you, as a team, collectively identify and say, hey, well, this is what the data is telling me and having that that synergistic, those conversations in regards to interpreting the data. Um, do you guys have a methodology or, or what does is, what is that, that congruency look like? Yeah, so Christian, um, you know, to build on what you're saying, absolutely, Bridgeway has a methodology. And, you know, in my 18 years there, I helped shape how we would, would communicate about it. And so I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, the philosophy is unchanged since 1993. And, you know, the processes that go into it really pin off of the fourth major principle in the, in the philosophy. Number one, we've been talking about data drives everything for Bridgeway in the quantitative investment process. The second is that factors shape returns. And when I say factors, what that means in Bridgeway's world is these drivers of, ex of expected risk and return. And you know, the head of research at Bridgeway, Andy Birkin, has written a, co-written a whole book called The Complete Guide to Factor-Based Investing that talks about what Bridgeway and others mean about factors. And then 
the third component for Bridgeway that starts to get more unique of Bridgeway among other quantitative investors is that strong factor exposure and diversification improve portfolios. That, you know, that's where, um, though that is, think of a decision framework that that investment team, like you emphasize, when they get together on a weekly basis to vet research, they're saying, okay, do we have strong factor exposure here? And do we have diversification? And, and if we have that in a systematic model, then, and, it, and that is gonna contribute to a portfolio having that present, then that's gonna meet the bar. The fourth piece of Bridgeway's investment philosophy is the idea that we're always, I, I like a way to say it is staying curious. So continuous investment in research, in people, um, also, staying invested in the portfolio. Bridgeway is mostly an equity, you know, stock market investor. People hire Bridgeway to be invested in the stock market, not to decide, hey, I want to hold your money in cash, for example. So that's another piece of the continuous investment process is that when the team is vetting ideas, it's like, can this stay invested through the ups and downs of the stock market? Have we built a portfolio? that is diversified enough, robust enough to navigate, you know, what we all know to be a roller coaster ride to some extent. Uh, so, so that's a little bit of an answer to your question, but um, I will end with, it's very team oriented. That's one of the things that attracted me to Bridgeway is who I am as a person, who I will continue to be as I figure out what my next adventure is at the intersection of profit and purpose is that we believe in the diversity of thought that comes together when that team comes together. And it, and it really is the highest bar and level of rigor to create an investment portfolio that, that we can have confidence putting clients in. That is so incredible. You guys have those four buckets and that methodology that filter through that. I wanna go down the curiosity bucket, if you will, and go down that a little bit further. Uh, you mentioned, and we were talking offline a little bit about, well, ESG, but also AI. There are certain exciting things, right? Staying curious and how to, as companies, um, just like I, I see, and, and this may not be the best analogy, but the same way that companies had to leverage social media for their marketing strategy, I'm noticing it, every company has to somehow integrate these new technologies somehow, right? And see how they can leverage it, whether it's being more innovative, whether it's being more effective, whether it's just streamlining processes and all sorts of different things. We're seeing that in different kind of attributes in companies, uh, but also, um, you know, also investing strategies. But mm -hmm. what also is interesting is as a market is hot and sexy, right? We kind of saw this maybe a few years back with crypto. Everything, a lot of money was being raised because it was, it was a sexy thing, it was exciting. So sometimes as an investor, you can deploy capital in something that maybe all the red flags are flashing, but then all of a sudden like you go against your, your investment thesis. So uh, really first question is overall, let's start with AI. Uh, what are you seeing? How do you think companies and investors should navigate that to ensure that um, they're integrating it properly into their own business, but also investors deploy capital in the right opportunities that actually have a good market product fit? Sure. Oh, I, I mean, as we, as we talked just before we came on, I'm, I am definitely fascinated by this topic and it's, you know, coming full circle for me because, you know, I took an artificial intelligence class as an undergrad when I was studying computer science and kind of didn't do anything else with it. And then now it's like the hottest thing since sliced bread right at the moment where I'm thinking about, you know, am I going to pivot with this next step in my career? Am I going to stay in the investing world? Anyway, it's, and they're, they're kind of colliding in, in a way, but just to, just one opportunity that I see that, you know, again, it's, it's so wonderful. I'm, I'm doing a bit of a listening tour just to see what's on people's minds. And a friend told me about a website that if you are in high school or college or you love somebody who's in high school or college or you're just still a kid at heart like me, um, there's a website called 80,000hours.org that is targeted at helping people, young people especially, think about what fields to study and what careers to go into to have the biggest impact in the world. And I started perusing this website and I was just struck by the fact that there's, I think, a big investment opportunity that they've identified, that, but they're not thinking about it that way. They're trying to just get people to go into these careers, but they're saying, look, there are 
billion being invested in the advancement of art artificial intelligence. Just billions of dollars and people and just so much maybe over investment in the advancement of it. And very little, not nearly enough, almost nothing in their words, go into um, how are we going to ethically and responsibly make sure that artificial intelligence doesn't erode or frankly destroy some of the other things that our society needs to have in order to not be harmed by artificial <laughs> intelligence. And so I thought that was fascinating. Um, so back to the investing, I think there's a huge investment opportunity to like find the companies and small organizations and entrepreneurs who want to do something about um, not just helping AI advance, but do it responsibly um, and make sure that we don't destroy ourselves or something else that we care about in the process of advancing AI. So I, again, I am like not very knowledgeable on this. I read all this on this website, but I was fascinated by, hmm, there could be a big investment opportunity there. Like we, we do that, like we, we invest in herds. And so everybody's like investing over here, but not nearly enough being invested on, you know, kind of maybe what I might label the compliance and controls aspect um, and the ethics aspect of artificial intelligence. Um, and some of those things that we've put in place, for example, after 20 years of social media, uh, as one example, you know, what does every parent do when they first give their child a device? You know, they're putting these security things on it and things like that. So anyway, a lot kind of go on because you can see my thoughts aren't fully formed, but I do think that's an investment opportunity that not a lot of people are thinking about related to artificial intelligence. Um, and I'll pause there, Christian, um, because I'm thinking about some other things that, you know, you might want to. Uh, no, that's good. A, go a different direction. No, this is perfect. Let's kind of dive into this a little bit. At a macro level, just uh, you know, on your opinion, why do you think there is low amount of deployed capital into more of that quality assurance? Right, we are seeing that. That is obviously Elon Musk has mentioned that. Uh, a lot of other very well-known business individuals have mentioned kind of the worrisome or the red flags about you know this this AI takeover, if you will, and that's some real concern, uh, definitely at the speed that we're kind of evolving to. So. Tamara, why do you think that there hasn't been as much money deployed in that, uh, just on your own opinion, and what we could do to ensure that um, that we are deploying some capital for, for the boundaries and building the right boundaries? Mm. Well, Christian, I feel like you just gave me a hom homework assignment, and I'm so glad you did because, you know, I don't have a good answer to that. That is that is a question that I, I, need, to, I need to ponder more. Um, why is that? I mean, it, it is back to us talking about history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. I, I do think it's something that we do see consistently when you see the emergence of different, uh, you know, I'll label them broadly, technologies, right? It's like we, um, it's like, uh, what is it? Ready, fire, aim. Like that's what we, it's like a human, I think it's, we're human. I think it's a human tendency to, jump and then think about, you know, especially our, you know, our more risk seeking, you know, fellow human beings, you know, they want to jump first and then figure out, you know, whether or not there should be a trampoline underneath. Uh, so that's my first instinct. What, what about you? Do you have thoughts on that? Like, I, I, I haven't thought enough about this question, but this is what I mean about staying curious. I'm learning something as we're, <laughs> as we're talking. Well, it's, it's just always an interesting conversation. I've always had this, this conversation offline as well. And, you know, you know, with some of my buddies and it's interesting how they, they navigate that uh, because it is, it is concerning, but also it's one of those things that I always look at. It's like, um, I, I think we look at, does the end justify the means kind of concept, right? Mm. Hey, yes, this AI can be, you know, very beneficial in med tech or healthcare or, you know, saving lives. And so sometimes, yeah, in that context, but also you and I know it's just like money, right? Money can be used for a good thing. Money can be used for a bad thing, right? Yeah. Same thing with, with anything, right? And AI can be used the same way. And so if it's just, it's the operator who's the one that's operating it, but we also have, just like social media, we notice. And so that's why I, I always just want to see, you know, obviously get your opinion on that as well. Now, I want to dive into a little bit on the ESG side of things. I always find this conversation so interesting. You guys have a really cool strategy and perspective on ESG. You guys focus on a lot of impact side of things. But I really want to kind of take macro, how you guys think about ESG. 
in the proper way. And the reason why is because sometimes I've got some people on my podcast where we talked about where ESG almost feels like a misalignment to financial return. But also, mm. right, and so sometimes is there, is, there, is there congruency or is it incongruent in regards to the vision and the goal sometimes uh, for company but also a macro level nationwide as well. So um, how, does, how do you and, and Bridgeway, do you guys kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, react or, or approach the ESG kind of ecosystem right now? Well, I'm going to speak first as Tamara, just like my opinion. This is one of my biggest like areas of dismay right at this moment in time that we're in in the world right now, because I believe at right this moment, and it was different like two years ago, ESG, there's so much misinformation, and I'll label this isn't even a word of thing, miseducation about ESG. And that's like really frustrating to me right now. So I'll just start with, Okay, E, S, and G. Many people who will label that don't, may not even realize what the three letters are. So for example, and I speak as a Texan, a proud person from Houston, Texas, the G is, stands for governance. And it is very hard for me to imagine that if anybody stopped and thought for one second that governance would not be a positive relationship to financial return and something absolutely necessary. Just think about the most recent banking crisis that we had. I think governance was like kind of a big deal. And so anybody who says ESG and many of the time is wrong or bad, nobody, I, I actually haven't met anybody who thinks governance is bad. So why are we saying that, right? Many times they're talking about E and environment and they're talking about an approach to environment that is very exclusionary, which is really what investing was focused on like 20 years ago. It's not even how people think about investing today. Most investors are return seeking. And yes, there's a place for everything and there's lots of flavors, but I mean, the vast majority of people that are professionally investing and the people that want to you know, have their money invested, they are return seeking. So they are more focused on when E, S, and G can help either reduce risk and get the same return or enhance the return. And there's a place for that. There are, there's also a place for the old, what I would label the old style of investing around ESG, which is more exclusionary. There are some people that just don't want to hold, this is fine, don't want to hold fossil fuel companies in their portfolio. There's nothing wrong with that if that's what you choose. And you can do the analysis to see when that's going to help with your returns and when it's likely to hurt with your returns. But that's just a personal choice. And that may not be the highest return seeking choice. But if you have a professional investor who's integrating ESG, more often than not, they're trying to do the thing that's the hardest, which is to use ESG to enhance the risk return profile. And there are ways to do that. And many investors are out there doing it today. And we are trying to oversimplify a topic that is just not, not able to be oversimplified. And there's been a lot of misinformation put out there around this topic. Um, so that's, that's Tamara speaking as, as Tamara, but informed as having worked at, at Bridgeway for a number of years. Um, and I, if you want me to, Christian, I can comment just briefly about how Bridgeway's thinking about ESG, at least, you know, up, up to most recently. Yes, yes. Uh, I think it would be really good insight because, again, uh, like you mentioned, I love that miseducation, misinformation, I think is very highly involved in that. And that's why I've had some individuals where they're pro ESG 100 percent, but almost like how to navigate it properly to ensure that there, it doesn't totally affect the, the bottom line. You are still being, you know, profit focused, purpose driven. And there's a there's that alignment. So, yeah, I'd love for you to just unpack the way I appreciate you unpacking how Tamara sees it yourself, <laughs> but also uh, Bridgeway and how that obviously coincides. Yeah. So what what Bridgeway has been focused on and, you know, I was a part of, you know, all of the research that we did and how we've developed it up until up until recently is when and where does ESG, you know, have a relationship to risk and return? Right. What does the data tell us? And in places we believe that, you know, ESG is something that needs to be considered 
in a, an evaluation for a portfolio when it would impact risk or return. And you know, the research that we've done to date at Bridgeway has mostly found that we were able to find some systematic ways to integrate that thinking to address some risks in the portfolio that, that were not already addressed by the financial statement analysis that we were doing. So think of Bridgeway's investment process is driven by data from the financial statements and at times data from ESG sources that is addressing some, in many cases, tail risks that exist for companies that are not showing up in their financial statements that may, in, in our an analytical view, uh, have an impact and we, and we as people that are focused on results for investors have to integrate that information when it's material. So that's, that's how Bridgeway, and there's an ongoing research program around ESG and when does E, you know, either an E, environmental or a social or a governance data element or statistic that we can get on a reliable basis, when is that related to financial risk or return? And, and is it enhancing the other data sets that we use in the investment process, which at Bridgeway are primarily the financial statements of public companies? Specifically public companies, these larger companies that are focusing on ESG initiatives, um, I've seen quite a few. Do you feel like the data points are, are accurate in regards to what they're, what they're kind of um, um, integrating into their kind of company? I, what I mean by it is I've seen some where it's almost more of a marketing ploy than it is actually like are they actually helping the ESG side of things and is that integrated? So I just want to get your opinion, what you have seen. Have you seen a good evolution in regards to actually, hey, ESG, hey, they have that initiative, they are doing some, or some companies I've seen that are leveraging it as just a marketing ploy, um, which is good or bad, I, I don't really know, but it's just more of like just being aware of that, I guess. So what have you seen, Tamara? Um, I, w I would say, uh, you know, I think it's all there, right? It's all there. Everything you said, it's, it, you know, just like, I mean, when you're talking about, I think it's, you know, 3,000 publicly listed companies, you know, in that, that you're going to have it all, right? Uh, but what I, what I also think is happening is that data is getting better and better, and there is tons of energy and resources being put into the rigor that investors need and should expect to have in our financial statements to fully reflect what are all of you know the you know kind of results as well as the risks of these companies so that we can fully analyze them you know when they're perfect we won't need another data set right <laughs> so but I, I think we as investors know that not everything can be represented in those financial statements and therefore that is why there is sometimes a time and a place for other complementary data, which I would is how I would label these ESG data sources. And in you know, in some of the terminology that I've learned that think of that ESG data set as like a leading indicator in, in as what may ultimately show up in the financial statements, you know, depending on your time frame. It might, you know, that's what different researchers disagree and agree, you know, agree on is, is that going to show up in the financial statements in one year, in three years, in five years, in 10 years, but, you know, and therefore how strong is that relationship? That is what, for example, the Bridgeway Research Program will continue to be focused on is anytime we're using a data set that is not the financial statements of public companies, that's the question we're asking is, is, is this enhancing what's already in the financial statements? Is, is it going to show up eventually? When, how, and how's the market going to react to that? And I, these are the questions that are answered by decades and decades of statistical analysis and the diverse thought group of that investment team at Bridgeway. So do you find that those companies, uh, whether they're private or public companies, that integrate the ESG initiatives, do you find that their performance long term will outperform those that are don't prioritize this initiative? So, a um, couple thoughts on that. Um, and again, I'm you know this is uh, you know just my summary thoughts. Um, and there you know different people. This 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 is where diversity is great because you know there's slight nuances into what everybody thinks and. Um, but basically what the research, not just that Bridgeway's done, but the research that we've reviewed by others, is you have to think of 
you know, if you think of all the public companies in a distribution, if you think of the edges of it, the tails, the extremes, um, the ones that have done really, really well, like outsized above their competitors by some of these ratings or, you know, whatever measure you're going to use, um, they, they have statistically this small group that, of outperformers in that area of either E, S, or G, or some characteristic like that. They have tended to be rewarded for that. And also on the negative side, the real outliers, the controversy companies, the ones that are doing a really bad job, the, the huge polluters, they tend to be penalized. But those are very small tails. And the big group in the middle, the, they're mostly indistinguishable, right? Like everybody, and that's what I would call the table stakes group, right? Like there's a table stakes of ESG that, you know, frankly, Europe is a decade ahead of the United States in terms of requiring certain things of companies. And that table stakes is just going to continue to grow, you know, I'll label it higher and higher in terms of what, you know, you can't just be all talk and no action on. Um, so that that would be my, my take on it. Gotcha. Do you... Um... Because you, I think I've had one individual on where he was talking about ESG does not outperform or ESG initiative companies do not outperform companies that just focus on, you know, grow at all costs. But I was also explaining to him that sometimes those companies that grow at all costs, they don't always have the best culture, right? And that's the same kind of situation where it's like internally you may be growing, your investors are happy, but to the team that you're hiring, the culture is sucks, right? So, is, you know, it's, it's again, does the end justify the means? And the reality is I, I don't think so. So I, I like your approach in regards to I always, I always look at ESG as a as, – as a, um, to me, I think looking at your company saying, hey, this manufacturing process, it's not going against you – know, it's going against environmental concerns. How can we innovate this? How can we get this cleaner? But also that gives you an opportunity to revisit something that maybe hasn't been revisited for a long time in your company and able to say, hey, how do we go alongside with this environmental side of things, right? But also ways to innovate. Right, clean it yeah. up, but also that may be by capital expenditure, by you know, um, building innovation, AI, technology, whatever it may be. All of a sudden, you simplify that manufacturing process, and now all of a sudden, sure, it may be short term, a lot of capital expenditure on the balance sheet, but at the end, over a ten year period, it's actually returned a lot more because now we don't need as many people on the on the manufacturing line, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You, you can see how it just trickles down. So that's the way yeah. I sometimes see ESG and and, and and is is that the is that a good way of thinking about it? I mean that's the way I, I you know just humble Christian over here <laughs> thinks thinks about it. But I, I wanted to get your kind of response on uh, that, just the integration and a lot of how people should think about ESG and that capitalism and how it can integrate together. Yeah, so no judgment about your view here, but you know, like I, I think that we need a broad diversity of views. This is kind of where we started, Christian, is like this is a complex topic that can't be simplified down. The way I like to think about it is that um, to distinguish between how a company's operating, which is in today's world, what a lot of the public ESG ratings are measuring is how a company is operating, like actually what they're doing in terms of treating of their people, treating of the environment, you know, how they're governed. That's what ESG is typically referring to. And then what they're doing, what they're making, the product they're making is, um, you know, it's it can, I mean, some people lump that in and think about that as ESG. Um, it's more often thought of as impact, you know, like, are you making a product or delivering a service that is bettering the world? That, you know, again, back to terminology, you can lump that into ESG and call that ESG, or, you know, uh, distinguish that and think of that as more as the impact on the world, right? Um, so uh, that's what it gets complicated. But, I, you know, it can be both and. Um, humans have a hard time. I've been training myself. You know, we like to think in either or, but it's kind of both and. But we do need to realize that, how a company operates is can be very different than you know what they're making and their impact on the world and this is where you come back to a place we were earlier about the fossil fuel companies you know the major oil companies when you look at how they've operated how they've treated their people how they do on you know their relative industry scores and things like that like these are well-run companies in many, many cases that can do way better, but yet, you know, they're 
quote, hated, and, and, and again, justifiably so by um, people who really think, hey, we should just have a step change from fossil fuel to you know, renewables and you know, we don't need much of a transition or these companies have been neglectful and should have been investing faster over you know, decades, all those things. And you know, I'm you know, very happy to be a part of discussion there. I have a lot to learn myself. But for example, when you look at just coming back, a company like that that's large and been operating globally you know, for decades, has a large base in Europe, they are going to look really good on how they operate according to ES and G measures many times and maybe better than that startup tech company um, that, you know, doesn't have good governance at the top and has had, you know, 10 sexual harassment lawsuits as an example, you know, like, so that's the how they operate, but then what they make is a different conversation and they're both can both be thought of as ESG, but that's why we can't like have these simple, you know, one sentence conversations about what ESG and impact mean. Yeah, and it's a constant evolution of it. Uh, but it's it's nice to start somewhere as a base and bring awareness yeah. to these companies on a public and a private baseline, because yeah. again, I think it's a trickle down in a positive manner, no matter what. But it's just a matter of navigating. And like you mentioned, obviously, there's there's a lot that goes into it. I want to kind of pivot a little bit toward uh, personal um, leadership. Um, Tamara, you have been able to lead as a president, CEO at Bridgeway for quite a while, capital management, as well as you're on the board. And I'm curious, over you, the evolution of your journey there, when did you start realizing your strengths? And then, like you mentioned earlier on in our conversation, doubling down on those strengths, right? Knowing your North Star and then delegating the responsibility or your weaknesses um, out. At what point did you realize that? And what are, would you say, are some of the, the biggest strengths that you, you, you have at, at a, um, that, that you have learned about yourself and your personality and the way you operate? Mm. So I, I think I'll start with um, one of my superpowers that I really did um, kind of come into my own of embracing at, at Bridgeway, because I was there a long time, was that I just really love people. And that, and that can, it's both a strength and a shadow. What does that, we, that's how we will talk about it. And, um, you know, my personal leadership philosophy and Bridgeways as well is around servant leadership. And that's the idea that leaders are meant to serve first. I mean, you, you're not leading if nobody's following you, basically, right? And, and how, do you, how do you have followers? It's because you have a heart to serve them. And I do, I just love people. Uh, and in the way to think about that when I say that is that I, I have a gift that I tend to see the best in people. Like I see people on their best day. What does that mean? I mean, it's good, right? Like it, but um, it also means that I surround myself with people and I had to learn to do this um, with maybe that see people on, also on their worst day and I have to learn to listen for that kind of advice, to have a more balanced view of how to lead people, how to um, deploy a diverse team on a project. You know, one of your biggest jobs as a, as a leader and especially a CEO is what I'll just label, it's, it's kind of a boring term, I should come up with a more fun term, but resource allocation, like putting the right people in place and giving them the right tools and resources to do what they need to do. That's, that's what great leaders do and then, and then they sit back and watch and support. Um, you know, did I achieve that 100% of the time? No way. I was happy if I achieved that 30% of the time. I felt pretty successful. <laughs> but, um, but that's just a little bit about how I think about leadership, what my unique gift has been, and what I kind of realized over my career at Bridgeway was, you know, it's great to love people and it's a huge strength, but, you know, I got whacked on the head many, many times where it wasn't the greatest strength if I didn't listen to the people around me. Um, to, for example, the, the most poignant example I give is just getting the right teams on projects because you know I see you at your best, Christian. I don't see, for example, that you know yes you're great at being creative, but you'll never meet a deadline. You know I need to pair you with somebody who meets a deadline, and I might not see that, but my colleagues would. And and we had we created a very strong culture of candor. Bridgeway where people could would 
you know, feel like they could speak openly. That is one of the things that I cherish the most and hope I can continue to accomplish as a leader in whatever I do. Uh, and, and that has allowed me to use my strengths, but also, you know, kind of combat the drawbacks of that, of that one superpower that I have. I'm so glad the, the way you approach that. I like how you said it's, it's a positive but also can be a curse, but then you realize of becoming self-aware of yourself, realizing what you need to prevent yourself from falling into that all the time. You specifically talk about building an incredible culture of candor, and I, I love that approach, but I'm curious. right? There's The way you're able to share information with someone in a candor in a very truthful manner it's also the way maybe having discernment in regards to how to approach that, that conversation, that dialogue. So how do you have candor, you know, and, and truth telling, right? But also approach it in a respectful manner to ensure that there is, there's growth and there's not de, uh, disintegration. Yeah. So that's something that I am constantly working on as an individual. Um, and luckily I've received lots of feedback about it. So I'm aware self-aware that that is a continual challenge for me as a leader. Um, delivering the candor, never had a problem with. Delivering it in a way that people could hear it and respond to it, you know, it's a bit of a challenge for me at times, but I've gotten way better at it. So I, you know, thanks to my colleagues. Uh, and, uh, you know, the biggest thing that we did at Bridgeway, which I would recommend and I feel so grateful and I would continue, I've done it for myself, for my whole career, and I've been fortunate, is. Honestly, you have to be constant, just like we have to constantly be exercising, you have to constantly be doing professional development. So Bridgeway did have a, a significant allocation of investment dollars in leadership development for every person in the firm. We called it servant leadership. We con, you know, contracted with great business partners who you know, would take every person in the firm through a two-year foundational series of servant leadership and then continued you know, workshops, you know, two or three times a year. We did culture surveys. We just invested a great deal to give people tools to do exactly what you said, Christian, which was, you know, look, this is what we value as an organization. We value candor, but you, we, we also value how you deliver that candor such that the person feels respected and that they can actually feel hope that they could, you know, improve in that area that you're providing them candor on. <laughs> and you know, that is not easy to do, but we really worked to provide every individual one with these are our expectations, these are our values as an organization, and we asked, I mean, the values of the organization are really built by the team. You can't force those on people. Um, and the team validated, yes, these, this is, we want this, we want candor, but we want it delivered in a way that people can respond to it. And then we had to give people tools to get better and better at it. Um, and some people are naturally good at it and some people need a lot more work i'm i'm in the i need a lot more work on the delivery category <laughs> Tamara, i love how you're very self-aware have you always been very self-aware of your strengths or weaknesses you mentioned your colleagues quite a bit in regards to just this this the, the way you navigated these these, these questions and answers so uh, wh what was that evolution in regards to just your your own self-awareness of the things you need to work on the things that you need to focus on but also the humility that you bring to um, just the way you approach your, your strengths and weaknesses? I, I would say it's not natural, but it is something that I've, I've always been very intentional about getting better at. Uh, and the way to think about this, and this would be my advice to people at my stage of career and like as young as anybody could be who's listening to it, maybe talk to your, I uh, talk to your young child if you're, I have had the good fortune in my entire life to be a part of leadership development programs. I mean, like, I don't remember when the first one was, but you know, like I, I just always did those things. I'm talking about elementary school, middle school, high school. Like I was always college. I was always doing leadership development programs. So I showed up in the workforce with a lot of skills and strategies that I realized not everybody had, but that's just because I was always attracted to that. So I would just say, you know, I was naturally attracted to it. And so I got a lot of training related to self-awareness is probably the number one most important thing to have as a leader or a follower. <laughs> and, um, and then I chose companies. By the time I started reaching the professional career, I did, I was very, very selective about choosing companies that were, would invest in my development. That was one of my criteria. 
because I do think that that's the only way that you reach your professional potential is if you actually have the opportunity. And it can just be on the job experience. I'm not saying that you have to have training programs because sometimes those don't work that well, but just make sure you're at a company or building a company if you're a leader that is investing in people's development because people have, I, I mean, it's a belief I have, but I think there's a lot of science. I know there's a lot of science behind it. People have way more potential than you know they ever realize than we ever realize and that you know most companies are not tapping into the full potential of the incredibly brilliant and talented people that they have and, the, and if you can do that i mean that is a competitive advantage what a cool response and i love what you mentioned not only prioritizing the skills for that job for whatever that is but also the personal uh personal habits personal belief things that obviously on the personal side on self-development because obviously you got to make sure that you have a high self-image, high self-confidence, high, you know, a lot of this over here to obviously really scale uh, the productivity on that. And to see how that is going to be part of the DNA and the culture at Bridgeway, but also the way you operate. And that's kind of the way you make sure you attract the right team and facilitate it. Uh, so I really appreciate that, that, that response. Um, I, I really appreciate you being on here. Tamara, and just talking about just the incredible investment thesis, the way you think about ESG, but also the way you navigate at a strategic level and the AI side of things and, and what you've done at Bridgeway and how you've been able to really think about, you know, very data analytic side of things and removing that biases, which we all have, and really how you obviously live and breathe the data as it comes in and pivot according to what that what that looks like and the methodologies and the principles you've established with, with Bridgeway, but also the way you're able to, you know, uh, look at things uh, I really just appreciate you being on here for those that want to reach out to you or maybe be part of what you've got going on or listen to more of your content uh, how do they reach out to you Tamara oh well de definitely LinkedIn Twitter um, I'm on both of those I, you'll see me getting more active again I've been you know kind of taking a little break through this transition period but uh, but yeah those are easy ways uh, and you know, obviously, I if you reach out to me there, I'll get, I'll get you to email because um, being a Gen Xer, I I still like email. Um, so <laughs> that's awesome, so. you guys. All those links are in the description. I'll actually put some of her other content out there, uh, her other podcasts, so you can listen to that. But I'll put a link in her Twitter and everything down there. Um, and Tamara, um, I, I always love to ask, you know, uh, before I let you go, my my guest. You know, you've done very well. You are the CEO at Bridgeway. Uh, you're stepping down. You're the president. You're on board. Uh, you, you've done very well for yourself. And obviously, you're, you're, you're kind of stepping down to go to that next level of, of working in the consulting world, which is really exciting. But if you could think about that younger Tamara, right, and what insecurities did you have to overcome to become the successful CEO and president and board member that you are now? Ah, uh, this is... This is, man, you really like to make me think. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the first instinct that comes to mind is, you know, being good enough, right? Being good enough and also um, the, the idea, I did really think being a first generation college student that there was like this secret formula that like everybody knew and that I, I just needed to like, talk to people and find it and you know like then I would know right like then I would know the path that all these other people knew and that that's been the funny thing to look back now from this seat is like there is no secret formula there's only your secret formula and you know I, I do believe that you know I've I have found my secret formula and I've come up with a lot of tools I would say the good enough thing um, if you look at the you know statistical research is does break down over gender lines somewhat. So, you know, women tend to think that way more statistically than men. But um, I've, I've come up with lots of strategies and tools back to leadership development to really um, play, uh, play that game with myself, right? Keep it light, stay curious, have fun. Um, I had a coach and a mentor, she would always say to me, be gentle with yourself, Tamara, which I, I mean, honestly, the first few times she told me that, I was like, oh my gosh, the way I got here was not being gentle with myself. Like, I work hard being gentle with myself. Like, I have high standards. But now I realize that, like, that I do actually need to talk to myself about being gentle with myself. And, and so I do that more often now. 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. That is such a great answer. Guys, that is the CEO of Bridgeway Capital Management, president as well as board member, the one and only Tamara Fleep. Guys, that is Journey with Christian Evo's podcast. Until next time, be uncommon if you can.